right. Uh, well, welcome everyone. My name is Dan Richard. Uh, I'm the director of our Center for Community-Based Learning. Um, with us today and uh, helping with this session is Susan Trudeau. She's our co-curricular coordinator. Um, we have uh, two panelists that will be speaking on our topic of the heart in community-based learning. We have uh, Dr. Chris Gabbard from UNF and Betsy Dobbins from the Center for Children's Thank Rights. You. And um, so before we uh, introduce our panelists and, and have some conversation with them, just wanna go over a few things. If you'd uh, like to ask a question for our panelists, you can uh, go to our question and answer button that's at the bottom of your screen and um, I post a question there. Or if you'd like, you can raise your hand. And if you wanna ask your question and have a dialogue with the panelists directly, we can unmute you and you can ask the question then. So we'll, again, we'll do those um, in the order that we uh, receive them. Um, so uh, we'll have time for that question and answer session toward the end. Um, so before we uh, jump into hearing from our panelists, we'd like to get a sense of who all is in the room, uh, and get, uh, get a poll of the audience. And so Susan is gonna start um, our first poll, uh, just about um, your role. So uh, answer this uh, question that you see on the screen. Uh, what is your role at, at, uh, with the university? It looks like that's everyone. All right, so um, some faculty members, faculty administrators and staff members. So we welcome you all. Um, I think this is gonna be a really engaging discuss discussion. Then Susan's going to start our next poll and to talk about your experience with uh, community-based learning. So Susan, so how long have you been doing community-based learning or community-based work? And we have some different categories that that uh, might describe some of your experience. <laughs> All right, so we have some people who are just getting started. So wonderful, I'm glad you're here. And uh, some people with uh, more experience um, doing community-based work. Oh, that's great. I think there'll be something for, for everyone during today's uh, discussion. Thanks, Susan, appreciate that. Um, so I'd like to um, get to our panelists and have, have them share uh, with you some of their perspectives and their thoughts about the heart of community-based learning. And what we're really talking about is the emotional, the personal and ethical dimensions of our work as we work um, with our community partners in the community. And so today we have um, uh, uh, Dr. Chris Gabbard. He is a UNF professor and uh, the author of A Life Beyond Reason, a father's memoir. And uh, he works with agencies that serve individuals with uh, developmental disabilities. And we also have uh, Ms. Betsy Dobbs, uh, Dobbins. Uh, she's the executive director and managing attorney at the Center for Children's Rights. And she works with um, uh, young people, uh, adolescents who have been involved with the criminal justice system. So we have both uh, from a faculty perspective and also a community partner perspective uh, uh, today. So um, we'll get started with uh, Dr. Gabbard and um, Maybe I know that you uh, got into this work uh, from both a professional uh, perspective and a personal perspective. And the, both of those dimensions uh, influence your work. And so I wonder if you could um, tell us a bit about your, your journey into community-based learning and, um, and where it's taken you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me today speak about uh, my CBTL experience. Uh, I came to UNF in 2001 from San Francisco. And I have to give you a little bit of backstory to make all of this make sense. That um, my son, August, was born in 1999 because of errors at the hospital. Um, he had pretty significant uh, impairments from cerebral palsy to profound cognitive impairment. And he was a quadriplegic, essentially, and blind. So he had a lot of problems. And we moved to Jacksonville in 2001 for this job. And we had to find him accommodation as far as care in a school. 
And he wound up going to the Mount Hermon School for uh, Mount Hermon Exceptional Student Center, which is just um, west of downtown Jacksonville on 8th Street. And so he went there for a number of years. I would drive him every morning or my wife would drive him and we'd pick him up. And he, or he goes to the after school to the DLC Nurse and Learn, which is in Murray Hill. He would be bussed from the school after when the school let out at 2.20 or so. And he'd go to the DLC if the afternoon, then I'd go pick him up. So I had familiarity with these agencies already, uh, the school and with the DLC. And in late 2000, in the middle of 2008, I was interested in doing an honors uh, 2000 level course and they wanted to do it with a um, some sort of TLO or CPTL component, get the students out of the classroom and into the community. That was just then I think when the big push was happening to get the sort of community-based engagement going. And I, it did take me long with scratching my head and wondering how I was going to get my honors course to have a CBTL. I thought, well, I'll just, I'll have them go volunteer at the school where my son goes every day. But I had a reason for wanting to do this also. After my son's birth, I developed a line, a specialty in disability studies in the humanities. And so I've been working on disability issues for some time. And I really thought it would be good for students to see this community, this population, uh, because a lot of uh, students don't know it exists. Um, the fact that people exist, and I have to explain Mount Hermon is a school of about 165 students who have uh, significant impairments, and many of them in wheelchairs, all of them cognitively, profoundly cognitively impaired. Some have feeding tubes, some have ventilators, tracheotomies. You know, there's a lot of kids who are medically complex or significantly disabled. And a lot of people don't know they exist. A lot of people don't know that the school exists. So one of my primary goals was just to let people know the school exists. It is kind of tucked away. It's near the 95 interstate. And if you know what you're looking for, you'll see it when you drive by it, but most people don't know it from anything else around it. So I wanted to get more, uh, and achieve the uh, greater awareness for the school. I also had become friends with the principal, Mark Cashin at the time, and a number of the people, the nurses and the teachers, and I just thought they were doing wonderful work. Um, and there's a lot of problem for the, the people in that school who work in that system. They're not rewarded for their teaching in the way that uh, uh, teachers in other schools are rewarded as far as merit pay and that kind of thing. Uh, the system is really stacked against them. So I just wanted to bring attention to uh, this wonderful institution. So I thought the best way would be to get students to go over there. I already had personal relationships with the principal and the nurses and the teachers. So it was very easy. They, they were very happy to have people come in and volunteer from UNF. They had never had anything like that before, at least from UNF. There had been contingents from local Catholic high schools but nothing from UNF. So I arranged for this one. We had 20 students in this uh, honors 2000 level course. It was a writing course, composition course. So they had readings that went along with the work that they were doing, the volunteering. And they all had an expectation of volunteering for 20 hours over the course of the semester, two hours a week. And uh, it, was one of the, it was one of the best CBTLs I've done because it, for one thing, was organized by the honors college at that point. I didn't have to do a lot of the back behind the scenes work of getting paper signed contracts, agreements, that kind of thing. So I thought it would always be that easy. <laughs> the honors would always, and then what happened was there was a change in the personnel at honors in the next year when I tried to repeat it. And suddenly I found I was the one who had to go do a lot of the footwork that had been done for me the year before. But I had such a good feeling about what had happened that I thought, okay, I'll do it, I'll take that on. And then there were further complications that came along, but I started to do it every year in one guise or another. And eventually I got a course created in the English department called EMG 3613, which was disability studies and humanities, but with a TLO or CBTL component. And it always had a contingent of students on a voluntary basis going to volunteer at Mount Hermon. Pretty soon Mount Hermon wasn't big enough to accommodate all the people I had. So I reached out to Alden Road, which is actually very, very close to UNF. It's just north of UNF. Alden Road Exceptional Student Center. Similar situation as Mount Hermon. Although the kids tend to be more ambulatory and there's more cases of kids with Down syndrome and autism than there were at Mount Hermon. So a slightly different population, but they are also eager to have volunteers. <clears throat> the first time they had UNF students come in and uh, that worked out very well. And I realized after a while that there's also Hope Haven on Beach Boulevard, which is a not, is not connected with the school system. It's just an independent nonprofit agency mainly catering to families with kids with Down syndrome. 
So I worked out a, 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 volunteer, a, a, a volunteer system with them as well. And then I learned about on-campus transition here on UNF campus, OCT. And so I started having some of my students who couldn't uh, they would be able to just stay on campus and do the volunteering on campus. And so that was soon four balls in the air and a lot of balls to keep going, but it really worked out. And then I began to see a numbers of people, of students willing to volunteer in 2015, 2016, 2017. I saw numbers beginning to go down. So I had to troubleshoot why is that happening? And uh, Heather Burke, helped me kind of figure out, okay, here's a way we can the numbers back up to where we'd like them to be. Can you all hear me? You're all frozen on my screen, but I'm, I'll keep talking for a few more minutes. Uh, so Heather Burke said, why don't you have bit. your whole class just go to Mount Hermon? Oh. Yeah, but, it, okay. but it's fine, yeah. Well, long in the story, to, Heather Burke uh, troubleshot with me the problem, and then she said, well, why don't you just have the whole class go there on one of the first days of the semester? And that worked a lot. That was really great insight on her part. Because after people, students went to the school, they said, I want to do this. This is great. We love this place. And then I had less problem after that getting students to sign up. So, But this was a, basically an effort that was born out of my personal life with my son going to the school and then going to the DLC and then me thinking, OK, what other agencies in town do this sort of thing that I don't have a personal connection with? So it grew naturally from what I knew to what I didn't know. And um, anyway, I would say it's one of the most rewarding things I've had, I've done at UNF, personally speaking, um, where I feel like I really help students see a whole population they don't know about. And also working with population of disabled people who are kids takes away the idea that there's something paternalistic about it. If I had them going to work with people who are adults, I have a fear that it'd be a lot of unpacking of what that would mean in terms of what is the nature of the relationship. So one of the benefits of having our students go work with kids is that you don't have to worry about them being paternalistic because they already are adults and these are kids. And so we don't have to have that discussion, but I do, that is obviously an important issue that I bring up in the class quite a bit. So I have more to say, but I don't want to hog the show. So I think I should stop talking now. Great, thanks, Chris. Yeah, we, we will have time for, uh, for further discussion. Um, so yeah, wh why don't we uh, hear from uh, Betsy Dobbins, um, as I said, she's the executive director and managing attorney at Center for Children's Rights. And uh, so Betsy, um, how did you get involved in this work? And um, what are some of those um, emotional, personal dimensions that, that interface with, with the work that you do? Well, it's interesting. Um, I, have a, I have a sibling who has severe disability as well. Um, and so growing up with her as my sister and, um, you know, in some ways the, the challenges that, that we as a family had to navigate, I think probably informed um, much of my path as well, probably not in a dissimilar way. Um, and so, you know, I was very fortunate in my college experience to have four summers of very experiential community-based learning. And it was a very impactful way um, for me as a student um, to really engage in meaningful interactions with people in a reciprocal way and build relationships and understanding that really moved outside of the box. I think, um, you know, sometimes my experience was when we studied things in sociology or psychology um, or even anthropology, we tend to think of people and populations in buckets and boxes and they lose um, the complexities of their humanity. And so having the fortune of connecting with people in real time and real ways in college um, really cemented the value of that as a learning experience for me. And so um, I, after college, I pursued um, work as a social worker and ended up going to law school and have kind of made my way to leading this organization. Um, and a really important component of our organization is really creating those kind of experiences of, um, in some ways, I like to think of it as what Parker Palmer says, you know, when a soul meets a soul. 
um, giving space to bump up against each other. And that's really the dignity that we um, owe to the kids and the families that we work with. And so creating a learning environment, not just for our staff and team, um, but also for volunteer students who are coming and working with us and learning to engage with um, young people who are involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, it has really just been an important piece of, of how we connect with the people that we serve. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, uh, thank you for those uh, like brief introductions. And so now we'll kind of go into our question and answer and discussion uh, phase. And so um, for our you know, attendees, uh, as I mentioned, if you'd like to um, ask a question, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you, or you can just post under the question and answer uh, section. And um, so just to uh, get us started in that, um, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Susan, and she'll kind of lead us through this uh, discussion time. So I'll give things over to Susan. Thanks, Dan, and thanks um, for those introductions, Chris and Betsy. Um, Chris, just this morning, I was mentioning to my mom that I was doing this today, and she told me she read your book, and um, oh. she's loved it so much. And so she asked me to let you know that. So I'm going to oh. end girl for just a second about that. Tell her thank um, you. I certainly will. Um, so um, I have some questions that we thought of before um, when we were, I, I reviewed both of your um, profiles on the internet and some of these things that um, I'm gonna ask today are some, hopefully we'll spur some questions from our attendees. So my first question is um, in a time when students' realities um, are pretty challenging with the pandemic and remote learning and certainly all the political unrest that's happening all over the world, not just in the United States, how do we help students feel comfortable being vulnerable so that they can recognize their own viewpoints but still be open to um, other people's viewpoints? Well, shall I answer first or do you want to go to Betsy? Okay. I, I think it's sometimes good to be vulnerable. And some I have to tell you that often the first day my students go to Mount Hermon, uh, they are freaked out. They've never seen so many kids in wheelchairs. They did not know this population existed. And they come, some of them don't want to continue to do it. And so I have to kind of talk them through. So they're feeling vulnerable because their, their, their uh, sense of, their visual field has been disrupted by something they, they did not see. They would see 160 kids in wheelchairs with cognitive impairments and tracheas and that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure there's a way around that, uh, except that they almost always, I've, had, I've, I've only maybe had one student who, there's nothing I could say that could convince her to go back but the others eventually do go back and they find by the middle of the semester, they're quite comfortable in the environment. They've overcome the fear. Uh, and one of my reasons for having the students go there is not just to let these kids and our students know that they exist, but also to teach our students that they have something to learn from the students they're gonna be seeing at these schools or in these facilities. Um, my, I, I'm clearing something off of my screen here that just got in the way. Another thing on my screen. Um, they go there to learn from the people and not just to be going as sort of a charitable, you know, tourism that they're going into viewing these people, but they're going there with the idea of learning from them. And learning is hard and learning uh, exposes your vulnerabilities and, and it reveals to you things you thought were true or not true. And I think that's what happens for my students. My students, by the end of the semester, are effusive in what they've learned, uh, how much they've grown. Um, but along the way, I've always stressed that you're not there to teach them, you're there to learn from them. Learning from the disabled is the primary goal of this mission. Even if they're just kids, you're there to learn from them as kids. Um, you may learn something about yourself, and that's where I think the vulnerability comes in. We're all going to be vulnerable, and every time we learn, we expose ourselves to a new situation, we are going to be vulnerable, and there's no way around that. As for the current generation being more vulnerable than usual, this is why I think I was seeing a drop in numbers, less willingness to volunteer for a lot of reasons. And then I had to take sort of an uh, extra uh, rocket powered effort to get back to where we had been before and we did get there. 
but there was a natural willingness to volunteer in an uncomfortable situation had diminished, I think, across the student body. And I thought that was a bit alarming and I was puzzled by it. Yeah, I guess I can kind of chime in along that. I, I think that's very reflective of what, um, you know, my experiences are with students um, is we talk a lot about using these opportunities to be alongside and to get to know kids and families in a different way and how to navigate that really challenging territory of being authentic and genuine and vulnerable um, while also not coming from a place of fixing um, or teaching. And so we talk a lot about um, how the work that we do is relational, um, but it's not necessarily personal. And even though that is the dynamic, it still involves a lot of vulnerability. And that's a really good thing because of the muscle memory that you develop from being uncomfortable and being vulnerable. Um, you know, from a social work student perspective, these students go out into the world and they are asking individuals and families very personal, very uncomfortable questions. They are going into homes and organizations um, with a lot of authority um, and support, but losing what it feels like to be uncomfortable and be vulnerable makes it really challenging to remain um, humility and to be humble and to respond to those moments of grace where really what it comes down to is you're making a connection point with another person. And whatever the discipline is, whatever the, the modality is, that is the ultimate crux of it, is it's a moment of connection. So one common thing I heard um, between both of your answers was, is that there's a significant amount, or at least some, um, prep work before you uh, introduce students into these situations. Is that right? Am I right? I We're very protective of our our kids and families. And so we wanna make sure that students really understand, um, you know, kind of what their roles are and what the purpose of the, the interaction is and what the bounds of that are. Um, I have noticed too that students have an increased discomfort with just kind of being uncomfortable and being in those settings. And they're often asking, am I doing it right? Am I doing it the right way? And so pulling them away from that and letting them to, giving them enough guidance so that they can make connection and relationship while also getting them out of that um, kind of perfectionist student hat is sometimes a challenge. Wow, you know that I think can, as a topic for um, a deep study and another webinar is what has changed with the students. Chris, did you just say I'll add also okay. that we have a, a relationship with these agencies that we have to maintain good terms with. And so the preparation is necessary that our students understand that they're there to be a help and not a hindrance. Uh, these agencies are going out of their way to bring our people in and to work with them. So we don't want our students going in there and making their jobs harder. Um, so I have to prep the students to know that they are responsible people and they are there representing the university. Uh, so and we have a relationship that we built up over time and we don't want that relationship to be harmed by any of their actions. And I know it sounds pretty basic that we would have to lay it out like that, but the, these are university kids and they may not necessarily already know that, but they, once I tell them you're here representing UNF and you have a responsibility to represent us well and to contribute and um, give a, everyone a good impression of where you came from, then that's, a, that's something we have to do. And that isn't done just with a five minute speech either. That actually, my next question was about that very thing is that um, how do you find time in a curriculum with so many other demands to um, build time for this empathy building into what you're doing? I'll go first, I guess. Um, well, the, the, my 3613 Disability Studies and Humanities is designed to have a CBTL component. So I make the time, it's, it's, it's part of, Part of what we read in class is illustrated by their activity on the site. So there's a this synergy that occurs between the active experience of being on the site and working with this population and then what they read in terms of the theory or the background or the context of what disability means in today's society. And my class is a very political angle. Um, it's very much about disability rights and the struggle to achieve the ADA and different, uh, these things just didn't happen by accident. 
So they're getting that background history. They also hear the background history of places they're going to and how they came into formation. So, um, you know, it all, it all basically, I don't have a problem with finding time to do it. That is the purpose of the course is to integrate those two elements. Um, you know, from a community-based perspective, I, I am actually teaching a um, graduate level social work course. And so even though we don't have the community um, learning component in that class, we're, I'm still trying to find the balance of really infusing that, that component of empathy in and in, in thinking through how, you know, our organization supports graduate students or undergraduate students who are coming in and being volunteers. It is um, kind of that combination of really building a, a foundation of just basic knowledge and understanding. Um, if the, it is information that they've never had to approach or think about before, and then really helping to engage critical questioning um, about what it is, and then really also working to try to have them tap into their own experiences and their own body sensations um, about how they have felt in similar moments or experiences that might be different but comparable, um, especially when it comes to um, being disempowered or not having much of a choice in a situation, really trying to walk them through that and have that resonate in a place with them um, from both, both a body and a memory perspective. Um, I just I have I have some other questions, but I definitely want to take this uh, pause just for a second to encourage questions from our attendees. So just again, if you'd like to ask a question of the panelists, you can raise hand to um, interact or you can drop a question to the chat and I can read it out for you. Um, and the question that I have that's sort of um, in response to um, the answer that you gave to the previous one is um, about the difference between compassionate empathy and empathic anger. Um, and uh, how do you feel like, uh, do you see a difference in that in students or, or how do you um, engage them in the difference between those two things? Or understand, engage them in the understanding of the difference between those two things? Hmm. It's a toughie. Well, I have, well, I'll, I'll let Betsy go first so I cogitate on this. So I, I really love that distinction and I don't think I quite realized how I really reside in the empathetic anger um, space and, and how, how we as an organization have been really working to push forward that ideal. Um, so much of the learning experience that we try to create is really moving students away from this idea of fixing. And I think that's part of what that distinction or that line really draws. Um, am I concerned and do I feel bad for what's happening to you? And do I wanna to try to make that better in some way? Which to me falls more in that compassionate um, empathy where you're very much feeling the real feelings, but really takes us into a space of charity, um, which is complicated. Um, whereas empathetic anger is that I am really connecting in a real way to your experiences and your feelings. And I am feeling equally as upset as you are, knowing that it's not my place to fix it, but that there are things that I can do to try to change the situation or make the, cha make the situation better. And I have to do that alongside you, not to you and not for you. Um, and, and so that's a really, for us, at least from an organization and from a learning paradigm, really important. It's okay, we're angry all the time <laughs> about the things that our kids and our families um, experience, but we don't, we're angry and we're outraged, but we want to work with individuals to make the situation better. Um, and it's also not our place to take away from their own power to make choices and to respond in the ways that they respond to the situations that they're in. Um, I think the best way to kind of articulate what that looks like is, you know, we have kids who make a lot of mistakes and um, we, can, we can be angry about the structural issues that are kind of limiting their pathways to make those mistakes while also um, being 
sad or angry with the kid for making that mistake, but not taking their power away to make that mistake because ultimately it's still their lives and they have to make the paths that they need to make. We can try to work together to address the environment and the situations around them. I do everything I can to encourage anger. <laughs> Let me explain that. Um, on the one side, you get students who want to do the volunteering because of a conservative paternalism or a liberal paternalism. The conservative paternalism usually is Christian based. They want to do a good deed, do good, good works and charity. Uh, and the liberal paternalism has to do with kind of a do-gooder uh, impulse, uh, kind of, it's more secular, but it still has sort of the same kind of um, distancing mechanism with the client. And the empathic anger has to do, what I try to stoke in the class, has to do with just showing the history of um, the disability rights movement and how disabled, disabled people have been treated in history. So they understand that places like Mount Hermon just didn't pop up out of the goodwill of people. It came out of struggles that were people in past generations had to do something actively and sometimes had to risk themselves, risk going to jail, risk being arrested, um, and devoting hours and hours and hours and hours of personal time to causes that often seemed hopeless at the moment when they were being fought but somehow won in the day, like the 504 campaign that occurred in the, in the 1970s. Um, so once my students kind of get that historical background and also read authors who are disabled and talk about this disability experience, they come, I think, to a more empathic anger to realize when they're going and servicing people at Mount Hermon, um, there's a history behind that. These kids just don't pop out. They're just not un unfortunate mistakes of nature, but actually are, uh, a part of the social fabric. And what I really want try to get across is how poorly funded these agencies are and how supports for families with kids with disabilities are woefully underfunded, especially in our state. And so I give them the political context. So if they're not angry by the end, then you probably can't get them to be angry. But you know, but I think anger is a productive, positive force, a motivation to make people work because anger will sometimes get you out of bed better than loving thoughts will in the morning. Um, so not that I don't try to balance it with a more even keeled or uh, humanistic approach, but because that's, I think what, that's what the literature does. Reading blind poets or people with disabilities, their, their prose, their, their, their discussing their life experiences. Flesh, this gives me, sending my students to Mount Hermon gives me an opportunity to read those poets and those um, disabled writers with more empathy. I mean, the empathy comes from what they're hearing from what they're seeing in print and what they're seeing in videos and stuff like that. So um, it comes from many different places. And if I could just piggyback on that, I thought what you said is really important. And, and I, I think that's another, from a learning perspective piece that's really important. If it's if you're just feeling sorry for people, then it's going to feel okay to just donate twenty five dollars when you're a college graduate, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what you know, it sounds like Chris is building, and 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 what we try to do in channeling that outrage is to develop sustainable action and sustained action um, because it is driven by those deeper understandings and those deeper contexts and meaning um, that derive out of those empathetic interactions um, and being very personally impacted by how those larger forces um, are impacting people that you come into contact with. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels like going um, post pandemic you know, I'm seeing with, in my work with young people that there's um, a lot of empathic anger right now being channeled. And I'm feeling like going forward that this might be a, maybe we'll see an upswing in the, in the um, a willingness to be vulnerable and work with the kind of work that you're doing. We do have a question from the chat. Um, so I'll read this out. How do you manage the empathic anger in a healthy way when you have a heart for them and you know more should be available to them? Hmm. I'm not sure I channel it. <laughs> I'm not sure I do a very good job of um, keeping the anger under control, but I do just try to find ways. I understand that one cannot always act as directly as one would like, but one can build for the future and building for the future, it takes patience. 
And that's what teaching is often about, is that often you don't expect to see the outcome immediately, but you hope that you will see outcomes over the period of time. For example, I've had students who volunteered at Mount Hermon who over the years have done other things involved with, they stayed in contact with that school um, one way or another. Uh, there's been there's a student like 2013 or 2012 will contact me and tell me what they've been up to, send me an email about their current activities and how that can influence them and change support. And a number of emails like that. So that, that helps with balancing the empathic anger in such a way that I think it's constructive. Um, I, I think for me, it goes back a little bit to, um, the way that, that we work to maintain boundaries, right? And, and again, I, I think this idea of, of souls being alongside each other is, is the way that, that I and our team at least try to intellectually manage that, um, is that we can all be in, in empathetic anger together and we can all be in really powerful action to try to make change and try to make things better. Um, and, you know, while not taking away, at least, you know, in the context of the kids and families that we work with, um, their ability to make mistakes. No one takes away my ability to like make mistakes or make the choices that I make. And, um, so that's one way that we at least try to balance it. We can be outraged and angry and engaged in really deep work um, to change things and to make them better. But we're doing all of that so that people have continue to have freedom of movement and freedom of ability to express kind of their entire spectrum of humanity and being, um, not just kind of a, and again, this is really specific to young people in the juvenile justice system or, or young people who so often are categories, categorized to kind of one identity. Um, I think empathetic anger requires us to kind of see them in their entire complexity. And that also acts as a little bit um, of a check on us of our own power and scope and role in it. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, one thing that, I, that I'm hearing in your responses is this idea that our, our goal and our hope is for more long-term engagement, right? More long-term mm -hmm. action and thoughtful action over time, as opposed to sometimes compassion uh, will relieve itself because I've been able to do an hour of service or, you know, I do something good for someone and I feel better. Um, and so uh, it can kind of be fleeting in a way um, that I, I help out, but then it doesn't sustain itself. It doesn't last. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a dimension to that persistence that um, that's a part of this as well. I mean, I, I can speak at least to the students that, that I work with, you know, in social work or in the law or any of the kind of helping professions. Um, burnout is really, really high. Um, like Chris has talked about, they are fields that are underpaid, underappreciated, full of challenges. And so, um, you know, really run the risk, not just of burnout, but also of kind of creating mirror images of the broader toxic kind of systemic pieces around them. And so if you don't have people who can be in those systems working and be engaged in reflection and empathetic anger, then they may be swept into some of the very processes that are impacting the populations that they're so angry about the impact on them. You see that with people who go to work for the Agency for Persons with Disabilities in Tallahassee, who may have gone in with great intentions, but then it is such a grind and you know the turnover in that agency is great because it pays very poorly, huge caseloads, and people realize that they just can't handle it. There's just too many. And you're exposed to people who need help, but you are often either incapable of helping them or you wind up adding to their problems. Uh, there's a lot about joining the system that 
um, militates against um, being able to really affect the kind of change you wanted to affect by doing taking up that line of work. That um, actually leads me very well to my last prepared question, um, <clears throat> which is, what is a lesson that you've learned over time doing this type of work? And this this comes from, from my place of working for a long time in student success and retention with underserved populations. And um, what happened to me is um, I be, came less idealistic like I had to realize at some point when I started I thought I could save every student and then at some point I realized that the student has to want to be saved right and you just you can't do that and so it enabled enabled me to redirect my resources so I became less idealistic but much more effective at what I was doing and so what's the lesson that you have learned over time that's affected your work In the disability community, there's something called crip time. And crip time means things don't always work the way, the way they happen in standard time. Um, people are late, Zoom meetings where technology doesn't work properly. Uh, someone's going to, going to talk, but their wheelchair broke down and they couldn't make it and, or whatever it doesn't happen, it's like crip time. So I've learned to become, or try to become more patient with crip time, that crip time is a thing. It's a thing I should take seriously. I think, I think my journey has probably been similar to yours, Susan. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm less idealistic. I think I'm just idealistic in different ways. And I understand, or I probably have a better insight into kind of the full tapestry of what creates change. And um, that sometimes the best thing that we can do for students or as individuals is to find our piece or our thread and to do that very well and to follow it through to the next piece. Um, and letting students know that, you know, if they are going to embark um, on a path like this, that it's not a straight journey and it's not a straight line and that that's okay. Um, and I think kind of coming to that realization and finding that knowledge has made me much more effective, not just as you know, a teacher and a mentor, but also at a fundamental level, the work that I do and the advocacy um, that we engage in. Those responses were so different, but they both resonated <laughs> with me so much. So I really appreciated that. Chris? Could I just add on though, that my of anger course. and my rage against the political structure in Florida has never abated. Um, my anger is still there and I, I don't know how to communicate that in a healthy way to students, except I do try to say that change is possible. But you know, as you're an older person, I think we can speak here honestly as adults, that we know that we have to basically give young people hope that there is possibility for change. But back in their minds as adults, we know, you know change may or may not happen. There's nothing guaranteed about change. Uh, sometimes change happens because of luck. Some lucky thing happens, some break, something breaks in a way that no one anticipated that helps change happen. Sometimes that change does not, that lucky break doesn't come. But we don't necessarily want to overweight the pessimism with young people because we have to also show them leadership that we have to keep alive the idea that hope can, that change can happen and hope is alive. That is um, absolutely beautiful way to um, end certainly my pre-prepared questions. Does anyone, um, any of our attendees have any additional questions or Dan, is there another question that you have? Yeah, I, I, I encourage our attendees, uh, attendees to ask questions. Um, uh, but I, I do wonder, you know, because um, often in community engaged work, we are interfacing, we're connecting with those um, emotional and moral questions, right? That that um, that are real uh, and real for the people that we partner with. And um, and I'm just kind of wondering how um, other people have responded in your professional life to um, you being willing to take on those dimensions, right? Um, so in, in in academia and in a lot of professional work, there's this professional distance that people expect. And of course there is some there, there's some objectivity that uh, is required. Um, but I think some uh, people 
uh, find that uh, subjectivity a little difficult to manage within their professional framework from within their professional mindset. And so I'm just wondering if you, how have people responded to you kind of taking on those roles in your own work? Dan, could you be more specific? <laughs> <laughs> which, which people? <laughs> My wife? So maybe, you know, maybe I'm, I'm thinking in particular about other professionals who work in your field, oh, um, oh. who maybe are more shy about diving into an area that requires more um, emotion from them, that requires more, uh, um, uh, a, a more of a moral response. Um, well, you know, we work in an institution that, that privileges uh, affectless rationality. We're supposed to be neutral and impartial and objective. And um, I feel somewhat naked because I, I talk about my son and my, you know, how I got involved and it's, it's all very personal. And But even in that world, there's still boundaries and professional relationships. And so it's not entirely personal. I don't blurt out everything. Um, but I think the people that I work with are all very, I'm lucky to have an area, disability, and these school uh, agencies in town that like working with me and I like working with them. And, and you know, so it isn't that much of a struggle. It definitely is an interesting interaction, you know, for me as a community-based provider. Um, and. And we kind of operate at the center of various professions and pieces of systems that are working with kids. So with the educational system, juvenile justice, mental health, um, dependency or child welfare, the legal community. Um, and you know that, that kind of arm length distancing objectivity um, is very much present across those systems. And so um, I think by now everyone has become quite accustomed and patient um, with, with me and, and with us. Um, and so often it's just simply sitting at these tables and saying, we're talking about a kid and just mm -hmm. helping people to reframe that. You can acknowledge that we are talking and responding to real people and real kids and real families. And that doesn't have to fully break down your, your walls or your professional distance or those boundaries, which are all healthy and do serve absolute purpose in these various fields. But you can't use those walls to block your humanity. You still have to be able to recognize and see and hear and connect with any person that you are working with or advocating for or serving in the community. Otherwise you are not serving them. I could just add one thing. Also, our jobs are to model behavior for our students. And so that by inherently is going to have some emotion involved. Um, for example, on UNF campus, some of the elevators don't work in certain buildings. And I know because I deal with a wheelchair using population and I have to model for my students. Well, I could say, well, gosh, that's not my problem. But my job is that person is to demonstrate to students, well, what do you do? Who do we get in touch with? You know, who do, who do we, whose cage do we have to go rattle to get that, that elevator fixed immediately? Because there are people who have to take a long circuitous route around campus to get to the second floor of building 10, for example. So it's my job to model behavior. So that's, that's part of it too. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, I, I like, um, both of, of your comments, uh, you know, Chris, about being a model for students and Betsy about um, allowing your humanity to influence your work and not kind of building walls against that. And, um, and I think students see that, um, they recognize that and um, respond to it, right? So they, they realize, oh, this is um, the type of person that I want to be right um in the future so um thank you all for your leadership uh in that way in in being those individuals who are willing to uh bring that perspective 
to the work that you do and to, to be an example for others to follow. Um, so very much appreciate your thoughts today. Um, I wanna thank all of our attendees uh, and thank Susan for, for helping out to, to, to moderate this. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel. So it will be available for others to see. And so we encourage you to share that. And uh, we do have uh, additional events uh, coming up uh, for around community-based learning. So I encourage you to check out our events page um, at uh, UNF CCBL and, uh, and, and attend, you know, see more of these events in the future. Um, thank you, panelists. Appreciate you very much and um, have uh, a great rest of your day. Thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.